everybody, welcome to another episode of After Impact. I am here with none other than Agent Smith. Mr. Bill you. And we're going deep on our boy Wyclef Jean. Hopefully you guys saw the episode, man. This one was one to remember. Like everybody here that was in-house was flipping out. We flipped out from the moment that we heard he was going to be on the show. Mad love to Dr. Finesse. Dr. Finesse is here. So hopefully Dr. Finesse, somewhere in the house, you hear my voice. Uh, that man is incredible. He was the one that secured us, Wyclef. It was amazing. Wyclef literally walked in the door with a crate of Guinness beer and uh, just, like a boss. Just the coolest he guy. Was, there's he was Dr. So Finesse. Cool. Dr. Finesse, you got to come just like peek ahead in or something. Yeah. Let this audience he know what's up, man. So this is our boy. In fact, he was last night. He was at the Wyclef concert. So if you guys are not following, it's too bad that your IG account, there he is, Dr. Finesse himself. It's too bad that your account actually isn't Dr. Finesse, but it is Mr. <laughs> Christopher McDonald. Check him out on Instagram. He was there rocking Wyclef last night. I, saw I, that. I was watching, so it was, it was really a lot cool. of fun. Wyclef was so cool. He, he was, was so cool. cool. I've been telling everyone about it. Yeah. Like he, he came in, he was... He just immediately started walking up to people, shaking hands, introducing himself, super down to earth, just wanted to hang out. Yeah, he was, it, it really was amazing, man. There's some people you meet them and you're just like, I get why this person's famous. Uh, Michael Strahan is another one for mm -hmm. me, like that guy. Like you just get it, like five minutes in his presence, you're like, all right, all right, I get it. Wyclef is like that, like yeah. he j and he was like that when, so I went to his concert in New York um, after, so he invited me that day on the show, said, hey, I'm gonna be doing this concert to celebrate the release of um, Juve, which is the lead up to the EP, Carnival right? 3, right, yeah. exactly. Um, and he did this big blowout concert. He ends up having the president of Haiti there. I mean, it was, it was insane. And I got a chance to go backstage. Maddie, thank you so much for making that happen. That was awesome. Uh, and our boy Nick at Vayner also smashed it. Um, and he was just like that there as well. Just super cool, really nice, really thoughtful, yeah. warm embraces all around. Just a good dude. Stay tuned for the episode of Red Pill Theory on that. We yeah, that drops soon, right? Yeah, in the next yeah. week or so. We'll take you guys backstage uh, so you can actually live that experience, see what it was all about. All right, should we dive into the episode? I think we should. I think okay. we should. So the one thing that really stood out to me about this was he is a master storyteller. White yeah, Club. he is. He is such a good storyteller. And I know we've talked about on this show and in Impact Theory how important it is to be a strong communicator in business. But how about life? Do you think it's important for people to cultivate that skill in life? Wow, man, for sure, for sure. You know, that's one of those things that it is um, to understand that humans have a desire for narrative, that narrative is how they translate their own life, narrative is how they make sense of the world. Like, when you really stop and ask like the fundamental question, why do we use narrative, right? So I think most people agree that humans just thrive on narrative, that it is a part of our makeup. But when you really start to ask the question, why? Why would that be advantageous? You start going all the way back to language and language being sort of the first technology that we invented that allowed us to give birth to culture. Culture mm -hmm. is the thing that allows us to spread ideas and ideology very, very rapidly. Like if you wanna know why we're doing what we're doing at Impact Theory, it's because when I look at the no bullshit answer of what it's gonna take to make cultural change. You've got to go back to the fundamental technology that we use to transmit culture, and that's language, it's narrative, it's storytelling. Um, and so when you really contextualize it that way and understand that that is what's driving um, the, the obsession that we have from a sort of neurobiological level um, of narrative, it's that ability to tap into emotion, it's that ability to um, help things make sense. Like we use that narrative to really um, understand Right, And so if narrative is our fundamental way to understand, whether I'm trying to entertain you, make you laugh, make you think, or like the real magic, and, and Wyclef did this to a T in the episode, is you draw people in with humor and then you hit them with something that's really raw and really real. And you're yeah. so open to that and you lower your defenses when you um, lead with the comedy and sort of the, you know, just really down to earth nature that he had. And so learning those effective things to prime people to be open. In fact, I'm reading a book right now. It'll probably be the, um, so we'll have one more book review before this, but then the one after will be on this book called Presuasion. Mm -hmm. And it's all about the ways you have to prime people to be receptive to your message. Mm -hmm. And if, you're a, if you really understand communication and you're a great storyteller, dude, you're, you're just priming people. So yeah, that's a long way of saying, I think that's a super critical skill to develop. Awesome. 
And so his story uh, is super inspiring, obviously. I'm, I'm loving that Wookie is like, she is locked she's essentially in a dungeon, and it still sounds like she is in this room with us. <laughs> and she's pissed about something. So, so Wyclef's story, I mean, it's, it's the quintessential American dream, right? Uh, coming from nothing, immigrant uh, story, comes to the United States and really just builds his entire life off of grit, hard work, uh, you know, perseverance, all these things. So I was really struck by, man, this is such a great example. We talk about mindset on this show so much. This is such a great example of a growth mindset. How'd that hit you? Yeah, that, that was the thing that blew me away in the research. And I, I really had hoped he'd be able to talk about it, which he did. I mean, just in spades. Um, researching him, though, I was thinking so many people today say that the American dream is dead and, you know, that it we just live in like this sort of dark time. Man, it just isn't true. And when you look at somebody like Wyclef who, man, read his book Purpose, like it, it's, it's crazy. So to recap, he's born in Haiti. His parents leave him behind when he's one. So mm -hmm. it's him and his little brother. They leave them behind. They go to America. And for almost nine years, I think, he lives apart, has no idea who his parents are. And so his aunt and grandmother who raised him would tell him like, hey, this Christmas gift or whatever is from your parents. And he would just assume that, you know, they were making it up, that yeah. he didn't really have, um, you know, parents in America. And he kind of suspected that his aunt was secretly his mom and um, that they were just trying to be nice to him by, you know, saying, oh, no, no, no. Like there's this mythical family over in America and things would be better for you one day because yeah. uh, he was living in such a dirt poor village. Um, so that was really interesting. And so for him to start there, then come to America, grow up in the slums. And so go from, you know, the rural village to the hard knock life of the projects that he was living in, in Brooklyn and still not make excuses like, oh, dude, like that stuff is, is my drug of choice. Like meeting people that have achieved at the highest level that really started somewhere, um, just, you know, total ground zero yeah. and be able to build up and, and, um, you know, uh, hopefully you'll, uh, you've got some more questions on there specifically about like how we use music to do that. So I won't go into it now, but, um, just, wow, such a powerful tale. Definitely. Uh, another thing about Wyclef is you can't really put him in a box, right? He's no question. Super. So let's talk about eclecticism. Uh, is it's that a poor. word? Yeah. It's eclecticism. Word. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, Agent so Smith we're... bringing the knowledge. Like this guy. Somebody, somebody fact check me on that. So I'm pretty we, sure we will fact check for sure. But even if it's not, I think it should be. Uh, but I have to say, like, I pride myself on words and vocab and stuff. But I, I come to this man. I, I won't. <laughs> I won't lie. Like, I think he's got the record, right, Cindy? You you with me on that one? And it's, um, the definition is a Look at that. Nice. Now, did you look at that up or did somebody oh, post that? that you looked it up? Nice. So it's a word. It is a word. Well done, man. All right. Well, so it's, see? It's my, it was my background. So. Oh, <laughs> truth. I've, I've worked at it. Hashtag truth. That. Yeah. Um, can't put him in a box. It's part of what makes him, un makes him unique, I think. Um, first off, do you consider that a strength, like cultivating sort of being eclectic? Yeah, no question. So, I mean, this goes back to ideas in equal ideas out. So that to me is the most important math equation in anybody's life. Um, uh, are there unique thoughts left to be had? Probably. Like, I actually think there are, but people will try to, you know, say, oh, there's nothing left. And I, I don't know if you guys know the Unabomber. That was his beef. Did you know that? No. So the Unabomber, like, ends up trying to kill. The reason he was targeting university people is he thought, like, that there's this sweet spot of human intellect where it's really hard, but it's possible. And if something is too easy or too hard, then like it just doesn't give you that sense of being alive. But being able to solve a puzzle that like feels like it's just right at your inter intellectual reach, like that to him was the purpose of being alive, like to do that, to have those moments where it's something just like, it makes you feel like, oh my God, I figured that out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And he felt like the way that um, education was going and the way that technology was progressing and the way that um, information was spreading, there were none of those left. So he was literally trying to destroy 
the higher education system because he felt like it was robbing humans of that moment where you could, and he wrote that whole thing in his like, it's crazy manifesto. But the whole point for me is that there's something so incredible about bringing ideas together that whether or not there are new ideas, like I, I, it's irrelevant. There are, I promise you, an infinite number of new connections to be made. And because one of the core things about making connections has to do with the era that you live in, the moment, the time, the technology, where culture is, all of that, like it will, it will forever be fresh and there will forever be new connections to make because somebody born today is going to think fundamentally different than the way that I think because of when I was born and what I grew up around so like that to me is is so interesting but the only way to be making those connections is to take in just like a rich world of information as diverse as possible to get as many differing ideas as you can get um and and that to me is you know god i really avoid politics but the thing that scares me about like when people get really divisive like when they don't even want to hear the other side it's like how does that can't possibly serve you right that's like it's literally like inbreeding. It's ideological inbreeding. You're, you're just trying to reinforce the ideas that you have. And even if it weren't dangerous, and I think that it is dangerous from just creating division, but you will stagnate and you will become irrelevant because other people are gonna come along that are gonna have a fresh perspective and they're gonna knock you off. And I've said this before, and I'm sure this is an obsession of mine, I'll say it again, is they say that genius is a young man's game, but I don't think it actually has nothing to do with youth. It just has to do with staying fresh mentally. And it just so happens that when you're young, you don't know enough to have it calcify into dogma. So it's not overly rigid, the thoughts that you have. And because because your thoughts are pliable and you're just beginning to learn and you've got this fresh perspective culturally, right? Because you're you know, growing up in a time where the scientists ahead of you didn't grow up, so you're just seeing things differently. You're making these connections that I was just talking about. So if you can find a way to stay fresh like that, you don't have to be young, right? If you reinvent yourself every 10 years, so take Michael Strahan I'm on a Michael Strahan kick. If you take Michael Strahan's business partner, Constance, who Constance Schwartz, amazing, amazing human being, um, every 10 years, she's forced herself to reinvent. So she was like, uh, she worked in the NFL. I think that was her first career. And she was in the NFL for like 10 years. And then she was a music manager and uh, managed Snoop. And um, oh, who's the guy that's, that's high like 24 um, seven? Snoop. Snoop, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Wiz Khalifa. Uh. Uh, and she managed Wiz Khalifa. I'm having trouble with my cables today. Uh, she managed Wiz <laughs> Everybody Wookiee has escaped. I have no idea how uh, she can apparently pick locks and open doors a Pomeranian. It's pandemonium. God there. bless it. It's mayhem. I love it. Uh, so, <laughs> so, yeah, I uh, should we should we beep that? Should, should we, we should or we or is it part of the fun? All right. We'll That's leave it I, we'll, we'll leave it. it. We'll leave it. Welcome. So staying fresh yeah. uh, is something that Wyclef talks about in the episode, yeah. right? And he's like even though you know I might take time off making music, it doesn't mean I, you know, I'm not going to be following the hottest new artist, Kendrick Lamar. Yeah. Um, he's working with a lot of new artists, young thug, uh, people who are up and coming. And um, he said that the, the way you're going to do that is if you are truly passionate about what you're working on, you'll never st you'll always be so interested that you're always trying to learn more, do more and just be in that space and you'll never fall out of sort of what's current and what's relevant. Mm. So is that a good indicator for people if they're not following whatever they think they let's, so let's say someone they have a passion but they actually aren't as up to date or they aren't following as closely as um, they you know they should be. Is that an indicator that they're really not passionate about it? Um, I don't know that it's an indicator that you're not passionate about it. And I think that it's a double-edged sword. I think there's two ways. So um, I think you can drink too deeply of what other people are doing and lose your own voice. And at the same time, I think that you can not drink deeply enough and not be relevant, right? And not yeah. be getting the fresh information that you need to make the new connections. But And, and I'm speaking very specifically to an artistic endeavor. Mm. Um, and so I think that it's... It, it's really a, a fine balance. And I think what Wyclef was talking about very specifically was being a cultural sponge. And at the moment he was talking about music, he's talking about hip hop. Yeah. And I think to be relevant, especially in hip hop, right? Hip hop is the only um, form of music that I know of. There may be others, but that's the one that I know of where they talk about hip hop culture, right? You don't talk about pop music 
culture. Um, and you hear that notion a lot, like do it for the culture, you know what I mean? So there's a real deep sense of that meaning something either specifically to the African American community or just hip hop at large. And so that I think to be a relevant voice in that, you have to know what's going on. And you'd have to be, especially as a producer, you'd have to be drinking deeply about what's hitting because, and he talked about that in the episode as well, like, and look, we hold ourselves to that standard. And I was talking to Lisa about this this morning. It's weird. Um, you know, so I'm walking the show at Magic and I'm walking by all these garments and things that would be really, really cool. And oh, man, I was just like, oh, this is awesome. And one of the reasons that we ended up um, turning Quest Apparel into Quest Clothing was when we were Quest Apparel, we were trying to do like high fashion, things that we thought were cool, like really be cutting edge, create a trend instead of asking ourselves, what sells? Mm -hmm. And so once we really put the hat on of what sells, it was stuff that was around the brand. It was more fitness related, way more casual. And so in shifting our mindset purely to like a market driven, like give me feedback, then it was like, okay, now we can move units. Now we're not holding inventory that never ends up going anywhere. So if you put that back in the musical context, if Wyclef or anybody else isn't paying attention to what's moving units, like what's selling, what's hot, then, then they're really going to be in trouble. And so from that perspective, um, the reason I think he mentioned Kendrick Lamar's mixtape is to say, I can identify talent before it hits, right. right? That's important for him as a producer. And so to do that, I think you just have to understand human psychology and, and music. Um, and then two, that yes, it, he has to understand like what's connecting with people so that he can give them that. And I really hope that we have a chance to go deeper on this. And if you don't have it, jot this one down. But he, you know, talked about how you um, can really go in and mine that stuff to create a hit, but only if you know you want a hit, right? So his whole yeah. thing was know what you want. Like yeah. if you if you can't be honest that what you want is a hit record, because he has done both, right? Like the, the original Carnival was in many ways a reaction to um, the success of the score. He was like, we, we sold, you know, what are, oh, Jesus, like 20 million, 22 million albums, yeah. I think. It's just nuts. And he was like, now I'm a pop star. I don't want to be a pop star. I'm, I'm a musician, right? And I want to really go back to something that was super artistic. So the Carnival becomes his reaction to that. So that was him understanding himself. Like, here's what's important to me, musicality. Right. And after the carnival, he goes on to do a lot more producing work because he showed people I'm about musicality, you know, going back to what you're saying about having eclectic interests, like being able to synthesize all that into a totally unique and different sound um, versus the score, which was expressly meant to be a hit. So the reason they called it the score, he talked about this in the episode, but the reason they called it the score was they felt like they were settling the score for the people who didn't buy their first album because they felt like their first album was great musically. Right. But it didn't hit commercially. And so they were coming back to settle the score with their second album and make something that was by definition meant to be big from a sales perspective. Yeah, that's awesome. I want to remind everyone, we're on Facebook Live right now. Um, you can share this feed and you can win an Impact Theory t-shirt. Um, and this is After Impact. If you haven't seen the episode with Wyclef Jean, I highly encourage you to go check it out on YouTube or on our podcast. Uh, it launched on Tuesday, and the link is in the comments. Nice. Nice. While we're checking in with Facebook Live, do we have any questions yet? We do, actually. Let's hear it. This one comes from Michael Foster. So he says, I love the Our boy, Michael Foster. From what is the best way to cultivate this mentality? Um, so hit me up with the very beginning. I was too busy trying to recognize so Michael. Love the no <laughs> excuses perspective. No excuses, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, Question is, what's the best way to cultivate a no-excuses mentality, which is something that Wyclef talks about in the episode. Yeah, so th this to me... Um is, is a great question because it's so fundamental, so foundational. So here is the very simple truth of how you do this with anything. So how do I get more discipline? How do I um, stop making excuses? You start saying, I'm the type of person that doesn't make excuses, period. Mic drop, that's it. Like once you start saying that out loud, you cannot help, you either have to say, oh, I guess I am a person who makes excuses and now at least you're being honest or you actually stop making excuses. And when you say it, like especially if there's close friends or a significant other who will, even if just to like 
put it back in your face, like even if they're trying to be mean about it, just reminding you that you said it. Oh, I thought you didn't make excuses. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. oh man, I was going to go running this morning, but it's so fucking cold. Oh, I thought you didn't make excuses. Then you're going to be like, oh yeah, I don't make excuses. I am going to go run. And for the first mile, you're going to do it like begrudgingly. You're going to be mad about it. You're going to be yeah. pissed that that person held you to that standard. But then it's going to start to be real. And you're going to start to think, wow, I actually went out and ran today. Like, even though it's super cold, I did it. Or, and there's neuroscience behind that too, right? Oh, dude, all, all manner of neuroscience. Yeah. So uh, what you're dealing with is ultimately it comes down to myelination, right? So you're going to, the, at the connection points between the neurons of identity and not making excuses, or even just the, the um, connections between the impulse to make an excuse and then switching your mindset over to not making an excuse becomes a habit loop, right? So you're yeah. using the excuse as a trigger to remind yourself that your new created identity is that of somebody who doesn't make excuses. So the excuse becomes the trigger to not make excuses, which is like one of those beautiful things. It's another one that I use is um, every time I go to criticize somebody, I stop myself and think of a compliment. And that works on two levels. One, it's almost always better. Not always, because there, there are times where you, if something is a real deficiency, especially in the world of business, you have to make that known. Um, but at the same time, it's normally better to lead with something that is authentic and real and positive, right? So to go from uh, strength to strength to help people, um, it's called the muscle on muscle technique. So, hey, there's this thing that you crush, you're amazing at this, and once we get this, where you're as good as you are there, then we're really gonna be laughing. Um, so that is usually a much more profound way to deliver criticism, and it also fo forces you to focus on that positive thing. So now you're just in a positive frame of mind, you're thinking of that person in a positive way, um, and then from there you can have a bit more sobriety. Awesome, great question. Uh, I got another one here. So Wyclef talks about the importance of knowing music theory in addition to knowing the latest technology in music um, in order to always be relevant, right? So is there an equivalent in business to knowing music theory? Yeah, 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 yeah. And the, the most obvious one is psychology. If you don't understand people and you're trying to sell to people, like you're just dead in the water. And that's really been, and that, that holds true for just sales and marketing in general, is you really, really have to have a deep understanding of human psychology, human motivation, persuasion, um, all of that stuff, like the brain, right? So, yeah. and that's why, and, and the brain really became my obsession because I was trying to get control of myself. And then I just began to understand like how potent it was um, in business as well. And that's why I ended up in marketing. So I didn't end up in marketing for any other reason than between film and just my desire to understand myself. I had spent so much time thinking about psychology, thinking about neuroanatomy, thinking about anatomy in general, um, with how we take things in tactically through our senses, uh, that that just made me already be thinking about, okay, I'm trying to sell to this person. What what do I need to understand about them in order to motivate them to make a purchasing decision? So, you know, that, and then, man, when I think about leading people, like if you don't understand psychology, you're dead in the water. Um, so that's, that's the most fundamental one for sure. Awesome. I'm going to kick it back to Facebook Live community. Any questions from our live audience? So this one comes from Ben. Um, so his excuse when he's working in the evening is usually, I need to sleep. Should he stay up later and work harder, even if it means sacrificing that sleep? No. So shall we, oh, shall we go oh, around why? Re repeat oh, the yeah. question <laughs> for our podcast audience. Uh, the question is, uh, the excuse he gives himself when he's up late working is that he needs to sleep, so he shouldn't be working. Um, but should he sacrifice sleep in order to work harder and longer? Yeah, and my answer is no. So, but here's the, the next question. What's your excuse in the morning? And that's where people fall down, right? So, if you, Ben, if you let me audit the way that you spend your time uh, from how long you probably lay in bed in the morning to how long your shower is to uh, the waffly way that you get ready. I mean, I don't know this guy, but I just like <laughs> thinking about like my own self and all the things yeah. that I've had to deal with, you know, laying in bed for too long. Um, like the amount of time that it takes you just to get ready. All of a sudden you're like 45 minutes, like what? Like what you could have done with that time? Like force yourself to get ready in seven minutes, right? Yeah. I look at my wife like she's an alien because of how long sometimes it takes her to get ready. Um, just because I can't bear that lapse of time. Like I literally can't, I would make a horrific woman because A, I would wear no makeup. 
uh, just for speed, or I'd sleep with it. Can you sleep? Like, no, no you're not allowed. Oh, well, then no makeup then, because like my hair would be in a bun or in a hat, like something. Like, right. you've got to crush that stuff down. So, anyway, we all have the same number of hours. It's about efficiency of that. I think sleep is a huge thing. If you've got a deadline or something, look, of course, like it's all gotta be what are your goals mandate. But one of my goals is to actually enjoy my life and I find being tired all the time a unique form of misery. Like that is, there's a ring of hell where all they do is make you not get sleep, right? Like, and think about the uh, military and what they do in the Marines, or yeah. sorry, uh, Navy SEALs. Sleep deprivation. Sleep. Oh, it's the first thing you do. Like yeah. if you wanna really mess with somebody, deprive them of sleep. And you're not gonna be as effective at whatever you're doing if you're chronically fatigued. So that to me is just like, let's rule that out. Um, so I get as much sleep as I need. I don't set an alarm. You have to like stop setting alarm and there will probably be weeks or maybe even a month or more where you sleep so much you think Tom's crazy, I can't keep doing this. But that's your body trying to catch back up. And then once you get through that phase, you'll find your natural rhythm, which I'm gonna guess is somewhere between six, maybe nine hours, maybe. But even if it's nine hours, like your brain will be functioning optimally. And at that point, like you're just gonna make better use of the time that you have. So, but you're gonna have to cut out TV. You're gonna have to cut out like watching cat videos on the internet. You're gonna, have, I mean, yeah, I know it's Love tough. Cat Dude, cat videos are <laughs> rad. And that's the thing, like there's a million things I want to do, right? But just, right. you have to begin to prioritize. You gotta be disciplined. So the cat videos got to go. Prioritize sleep, there it is. Um, all right, uh, another question I have for you, Tom. Um, so Wyclef is a, is a sponge, right? He, so he has all these diverse musical tastes. Yep. Coming from sounds he heard in nature as a kid living in Haiti to the rap battles in Brooklyn to the Christian rock band Petra. Yeah, buddy. Um, who who's the only band he could listen to as a child <laughs> that his dad allowed him to, who was a preacher. Um, none of it is thrown away. He still talks about all of those and how they um, came together to form something greater. So everything informs who he is as an artist, and he's very self-aware about that. How, how did you, how did that strike you? In the episode that that's amazing. And honestly, when when he said in the episode, like, uh, oh, what did he say? Like, um, something had a note. I forget the first one, but he was like, "This has a note, the bird or whatever." And then yeah. the wind has a note, and I thought, "What?" And that's when I realized, like, this man's brain like works differently than mine. And that goes back to the notion of early winds, like. Everybody has that thing. Like there's something you're gonna get early wins on. It doesn't mean that you have to pursue it, but when you find a passion for something you have an early win for, it's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. And so Wycliffe clearly had early wins from a musicality perspective. And we didn't get to talk much about the story about his drum in the episode, but like he would sneak out in the middle of the night to go play this drum that his church had. Like, like a little, it, when I was envisioning it, either like a small like Congo conga drum or like a tambourine with none of the you know the jingly bits, um, and so I was just like, wow, man, I was not like that. Like I was in band, I had a trombone, and I did everything I could to avoid playing that damn thing. Like I just didn't have that same sense. And his insight that the oscillator is a tone and that music is just vibrations. It's like, wow, man, it's it's really, really cool when somebody like happens on to something like that and they really like go hard for that cake. Yeah. Let's talk about the oscillator, please. So that was a big moment in the, in the episode when he talks about, um, you, you can just read the manual. The most important tool you have is your brain, right? You don't need a $25,000 piece of equipment. And he, so essentially if you've seen the episode, he reverse engineers this very expensive piece of equipment in or that makes one specific tone um, that he really wanted in the album. And he did it by going into the music store and reading the manual and then figuring out that he could kind of hack it through some other tools he had already at his disposable, as his disposal. I mean, that, that just, that like, I know you were shocked in the episode. Oh man, I love that so much. Yeah. Like that, that's one of those stories that like, don't you wanna be like that? Yeah. Like that's one of those, I just look at anything that you're tempted to say this is like too hard or I don't have what I need or whatever. And then you hear someone like that. And look, here's, here's the thing about not making excuses. 
all of your excuses, the, the worst part, the most sinister part about excuses is they're real, like they're valid. And once I had that insight that, that the excuses that I make, that other people make, they're valid and you have every right to be making them. They just don't move you towards your goals. Like that was when I started saying to myself, I'm going to do and believe that which moves me towards my goals, period. And at the end of the day, the way that, so you were asking like, is there a fundamental thing in business like learning music theory? And the answer is psychology. At the end of the day, the only thing humans respond to is extraordinary performance. That's it. So why the iPod crush? Because it was amazing. It was better than anything else. Their marketing campaign was better than anything else. And when I say better, because from a bits and bytes standpoint, it wasn't, but it made me feel something that the other products didn't. And that's what we judge it by. That is better. Better meaning I got more value exchange out of my dollars than I would have gotten from anything else. Not necessarily that empirically speaking, it is better from a features and benefits standpoint, that I have received more value from my purchase than I would have with something else. And so that comes down to psychology. That comes down to really understanding that. And so once you get that, once you get, that's the only thing humans respond to is extraordinary performance. Then how do your excuses help? Because it's only going to be somebody like Wyclef who says, okay, I may not have access to that, but I can't give you my album and say, hey, look, I couldn't afford the $25,000 piece of equipment, you know, whatever. Like right now, if you're trying to make music right now, you're going up against DJ Khaled, right? Let me walk you into his recording studio. It's better than yours. And like from a dollars and cents standpoint and the artists that he has access to, they're better than yours, right? Like all of that but you still have to win. Like you have to win. You have to beat him at that. You have to be better. You have to find an angle that he doesn't have. You have to out hustle him. And that like, if you don't know the story about Jay-Z, he used to literally stalk LL Cool J. Do you know why? No, I don't. Cause he wanted to rap battle him. And he knew wow. if I can, LL Cool J was the biggest guy, had the best contract in rap music. And he said, I'm better than him. And if I can like, track him down he would literally they would pull up to him exiting out of the back of a club they'd hit him in the parking lot just trying to show like a few insiders in the world of hip-hop that this guy could be as good if not better than ll cool j and so that like you've got to want that you've got to want that like you've got to be jay-z like i want to corner him in a parking garage and take my chance getting my ass handed to me because I believe that I can actually outperform, right? Not outmarket, outperform. And that's when it gets interesting. So that's what blew me away, you know, when Wyclef is, is talking about taking this oscillator, running it through a MIDI, and now he can make the oscillator make any sound he wants because he understands vibration, he understands music theory, like he can just put it all together. And now, because of his mind, because of his training, because he's focused on jazz, because he's looking at music in a totally different way, that he's able to outperform the people that have access to that equipment, the people that already had the ear of the music industry. Like he was just able to outperform. And because of his music, you know, everybody starts calling from Destiny's Child to Michael Jackson. I mean, just, they start coming out of the woodwork. He starts working with Quincy Jones, but all because he outperformed, not because he gave like some list of like all the excuses and people thought, oh man, I really feel bad for this kid. Doesn't work like that. No excuses. No excuses. That's the bottom line. All right, I want to remind everyone we are on Facebook Live. We are doing After Impact. This is a show where Tom and I sit down and go deep into the episode of Impact Theory for this week, which was Wyclef Jean. You can check it in the comments if you haven't seen it yet. Highly recommend it. It's awesome. We're doing some giveaways. You can share this live feed for a chance to win an Impact Theory t-shirt. And then I also want to do something else. I want to ask people, and this is a bit, uh, a bit of a sidestep here, but we have another content series called Impact Books. Tom reviews uh, books that are meaningful to him that have changed his life in some way. So I want to ask the audience, what do you think Tom should review next? Drop a link into the comments. This can either be from his reading list, the top 25 books, or it can be from something that you've read and think that uh, Tom should check out as well. We want to we wanna hear what you guys think. Nice. Do like that, that, and uh, you can win a book from the re reading list. Oh, yeah. Cool. Any questions from Facebook Live? Cindy. So this question comes from Jumaine. Uh, Wyclef mentioned the pulse of the youth. How would you integrate embracing your youth and pair it, um, pair it with knowledge and wisdom in business? So, 
Can you hit him with that? Yeah. Can you repeat the question? I didn't quite get it. Can you repeat I'll, the question? I'll repeat the question. You got it? Okay. So he, in the episode, he talks about um, needing to really have your finger on the pulse of the youth and that mm-hmm. youth is really what drives um, music. I think he was talking even a, a little more broadly. But how do you pair that with wisdom and experience mm. and in business? And the answer is that goes back to what Agent Smith was saying earlier about taking in just a diverse array of ideas and staying fresh and being a cultural sponge. And like, I look at what millennials are doing and I watch videos from millennials and I read articles about millennials and um, watch things like Vice, which is like all millennial all the time. (laughs) And uh, really getting a sense of what their worldview is, is it's, it's fascinating. I don't even think of it necessarily from a business perspective. I, that one in particular, um, I think about it from the, like, where is the, the perspective migrating to? Like, so if you grew up when I grew up, which was primarily in the, you know, late eighties, early nineties, then like, I know what that perspective is. Right. And so I can talk to people that have that perspective. Hey, Facebook, the world just got a little weird for you. Um, but Millennials grew up hearing different things with different kinds of parents who'd been raised in different ways. And so what does their perspective look like? And I think anybody's capable of understanding that perspective. It may not be your own, but you're able to understand it. So now I'm able to take the, all the experience that I have, my own perspective, look at their perspective, hold those two ideas in my head, look for the areas of friction, look for the areas of overlap. And then for me, I'm looking for things that I can use that uh, move me towards my goals. So if there's a millennial viewpoint or something, and, and look, I get generalities. They're never universally true, but they're helpful at a macro level. If there's something that I can pull out, extract that I think that they see that I don't, um, then it helps me move towards my goals and I'm going to adopt it. And it's, it's all ideas. Like it's just ideas, right? So even perspective is built on beliefs and ideas and you can adopt whatever you need and certainly just to be able to understand it. And that's why, I mean, this is, I think, going to become a real thing for me is talking about the division that's going on in the world um, because that freaks me out. And it's people doubling down on their position rather than opening up to another position and just trying to see things from a different perspective. And it doesn't like seeing something from someone else's perspective does not mean agreeing with them. It means understanding their perspective. Right. So, um, I just think that that's critically, critically important to self empowerment. Like I'm not doing it from like a, we should all hold hands and sing Kumbaya. I'm just saying it's empowering and, um, yeah, doing things that are empowering is always the right answer in my mind. Awesome. Um, I want to talk about the the moment in the episode when when Wyclef says um, you have to know the entire game. You have to have a 360 degree view of everything. Um, so where, so my question is, where should people start, and how do they measure progress along the way? And I'd love to walk through a little bit of, a little game here oh, and wow. throw throw a, uh, a hobby at you okay. or, or an interest and, and see where would you start to get good at it? Wow. This is cool. So just so you guys know, this is not pre-planned. This isn't like, Hey, hey t- you know, Tom real fast, just so uh, <laughs> you know, I'm going to be hitting you up with this. I have no idea. So I don't know where we're going with this, but it sounds very interesting. Cool. I'm ready. So why don't we get right. through the hobby? I think that'll be Let's interesting. say you want to get good at surfing. Okay. Word. Um, where so, do you start? so the, the first thing is, um, I'm, I live in a digital age where I know that right now on YouTube, there are thousands of videos about um, surfing. So I'm going to go watch anything that I can find. I'll drop in terms like uh, learn how to surf, how to surf, surfing 101, like, and I'll just chase those down. Um, I'll watch videos from some of the best people in the world, and then I'll try to find the best teachers in the world, which are usually vastly different. Like Kelly Slater is probably one of the best surfers, but can he teach? I have no idea. Um, so might not necessarily go to him and then as rapidly as possible, I'm going to get in the water Mm. and there, so I might, you know, like if I decide that I'm going to start surfing on a Tuesday night, I'll watch my videos on Tuesday night, but by Wednesday morning, I'm trying to be in the water, uh, because there's just no substitute for that experience. And I'm not doing it to look cool, feel cool. I'm doing it to experience it and find out quite frankly, if I want to do it. And if you remember when we interviewed Marie for Leo, um, on inside quest, she talked about that, right? Like there's just no substitute for getting your ass ass in the dance class and finding out, do I actually like dance class? Like, do I want to be doing this? Um, and you know, people can put things off for, for a super long time. So, uh, step one, I'm going to digest some 
information rapidly so I have context, and then step two, as quickly as possible, I'm gonna do the thing, and then I'll be able to better understand the information that I'm getting. Um, so something that I did was magic. Okay. And so learning magic, um, which by the way, I'm atrocious at. I've never seen any magic tricks. Yeah, see, no. and that, I really only have, I have one vanish that's pretty dope that I could do. Um, <laughs> no, I don't refuse to do the vanish. I do the vanish for you. Um, but that would like, I would never try to do like my, um, Mr. Clean three coins across. I would not, I would not do that because I would embarrass myself, but, um, I've taken classes at the magic castle and oh. like the whole nine. So it has started exactly the same way. I started by watching videos, started by trying to do it, do, 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 do. Then you watch more videos and that you begin. Oh, okay. Yeah. I totally get now what he's trying to do because I've tried to, oh, and I fumble it there or whatever. Um, so, and then rinse and repeat, right? And I would talk to as many other people as I can that do it. And I would try to find other people that are into it um, because you reinforce that in each other, right? So you and I would be spending our mornings, like I'd try to get you amped up, like, come on, we gotta go, uh, like however many, what's, what's a reasonable number of mornings to go? To go surfing? Yeah. Uh, every morning? Okay, because I was gonna say, whatever your number is, like I would do more. So like I would push you like- As long as there are waves, you go. Perfect. Yeah. So, and that, that to me, like going all in, immerse yourself. Awesome. So if you are, uh, if you go in and you immerse yourself and you decide you love this thing and you want to become the best at it, right? You want to know the entire game. Oh, now you're getting interesting. How do you measure progress along the way? Okay, so we're in surfing now. So um, I would put small goals for myself for like immediate term, and then I would have long-term goals. So if I'm really trying to be the best in the world at this, um, best in my age group or best? We'll say best in your age group. Okay, that's a little bit easier, and I think we can make it a little more grounded, which is admittedly a limiting belief for myself, but the amount of time and energy I'd have to dedicate to getting better than everybody else, like I'd have to start with like longevity shit. And so, anyway, um, so just to <laughs> keep it nice and grounded, uh, if I'm trying to be the best in my age group, so first of all, I'm gonna identify who's the best in my age group now, Okay. And I'm going to see what I'm up against. Like, what are the what are the things that they're doing that make them great? And then, okay, so that's my grand vision. I'm going to create. I would I would actually do a vision board or a faux vision board. And maybe it's the background on my screensaver on my phone as a constant reminder. Maybe I actually pin something up on my mirror or something so that I'm seeing it all the time. Do you do that now? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah for oh, sure, cool. for sure. Um, having having reminders is just super super critical of visual um, reminders. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Um, so that's super important. And so having that something that's going to cue me of what I'm trying to accomplish. And then also, um, I pick like something that I'm chasing. Like I, I won't tell you who, but there are on my phone right now, as I track the metrics that are important to us here, there are people outside this company that have similar metrics that I can view. And I obsessively check us against them. And I don't just check like raw numbers. I check growth rate. Yeah. So, okay, they're still growing, but at what rate are they growing? And just so you know, the people that we're tracking, we're growing faster, so we're coming for you guys. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I do that kind of thing all the time, and I let it, I let it hurt me emotionally. Like, when I see um, the numbers, or, you know, to bring it back to surfing, if I saw someone who was better than me, I let that hurt. And I don't dwell there. But that's like, I need the chip on my shoulder because I know it's gonna drive me when I'm really, really feeling fatigued and down and I'm looking at the rest of my life and it's beautiful and amazing. Like, why keep going? So there's gotta be something that like, you're angry about, right? So I love that. You guys have heard me talk about it. I think rage and beauty, you've gotta use them both. So I'd make sure that I have my chip on, uh, chip on my shoulder about somebody, something. Um, and then, uh, so I've got my big goal. Then I'm gonna break it down into small goals. So I'm gonna guess number one for me is dealing with the cold. So I'm gonna have to get over dealing with the cold. So I'm gonna be like Vim Hoffing it. I'm gonna be spending time in the ocean. I'm gonna whatever, like literally, if I, if I found that that was distracting, I would fill my bath with ice. Uh, and water like however many days a week that I needed to and I would make sure that I got good with the cold Then I'm gonna guess paddling so I probably don't have the arm strength in that way to do it for hours and hours So I'm gonna build that foundation um, and then I'm gonna focus on getting up on the board um, And then God what else would be useful in surfing? So once I could do that once I had the strength to do it all the time I could deal with the cold. I was able to get up on my board um, then it's gonna be um, Make sure I don't develop bad habits, which I guess I would have started before getting a coach 
somebody that can really help me short circuit that. So I do as much as I can with online coaching. Um, but you know, I'm obviously in a fortunate position where I could hire a coach. Um, if I couldn't hire a coach, no excuses, I would find a way to add value. I would take that person's trash out, whatever. Uh, cause you're going to short circuit a lot. If you can get somebody great, um, to tell you. And if I really had a reason to be committed to becoming the greatest of all time, I'd probably be living outside of, um, Laird Hamilton's house, yeah. like taking out his trash or something, like literally. And if you think I'm kidding, then you don't understand the way that my mind works. But I would be doing something like that uh, to make sure that I had access to absolutely world class coaching. Um, you know, I, yeah, it would disrupt my whole life, which is what it would take, right? Humans only respond to extraordinary um, performance. So I could keep going, but I think you get yeah. the gist. Would you, would you have a timeline? Would you map all this out? Yeah, I would, I would have goals. But one thing I know about timelines, you almost never hit them. But um, I think the one thing, and, and you guys can um, attest to this or not, but uh, I think the one thing that winds people up about me is I set such fucking aggressive timelines. Um, but that, that's important to me. So, like, you know, I mean, you guys know. My lazy goal is our ecosystem is yeah. 100,000 by the end of the year, but my real goal is 500,000. It's so. a lazy goal, the first one. Yeah, so... That's uh, aggressive timelines. So if you fail, happened. at least you fail big. Yeah, and that uh, you, you still you still get at least to a, a, a certain point. Right? Those are great words, but that isn't why I do it. And that's what people will tell you. And like that's a good way to get. Will you let me say lesser mortals? Sure. Okay. That's a good way to get <laughs> lesser mortals like motivated. But that isn't why I do it. The reason that I do it is if you want to 10x your performance, not 10% improvement, but truly 10x, you have to think in a fundamentally different way. Yeah. And everyone, everyone thinks linear in the beginning and you have to think exponentially. So that's why, like, as I was really sitting here thinking about it, I have to move to Hawaii and live with Laird Hamilton. That's just like, I don't see any other way around it. Um, he's a stand in for, or Laird Hamilton or right. some other great, you know what I mean? But like, you're totally dedicating yourself to that and that's like you would have to and that's why it's a big switch right you got to be careful what you throw yourself at yeah. but don't half-ass it so if i wanted to be the greatest in the world in my age group that's what it would take and so that's what i would do thank you for uh playing along dude that's that was fun. fun man all right uh facebook live do we have any questions brian his name was Robert Paulson. I don't know why that just triggered that neuron in my brain. So if you find yourself having one of those days where everything is a struggle and dark, what is your one thread to hold on to that pulls you out of it? That I can do anything I set my mind to. So sorry, I keep answering them without repeating okay. the question for our audience. The question is, it's like Jeopardy. Yes. So the, the question is, uh, if you uh, find yourself having one of those days where everything is a struggle, how do you hang on to a thread to pull you through the dark time? Yeah. And so that's my answer, that I can do anything I set my mind to. Like once you realize that, uh, that this is a game about learning and stop looking at yourself as of right now today. And I think a lot of times people think like this is sort of the, this is me. I'm me now, right? I wasn't me when I was a kid, but I'm me now. And me is somehow perpetual now for the rest of my life. So whatever I am now, like maybe I didn't have a fixed mindset as a kid because I knew I was growing. But essentially, I have a fixed mindset now because I believe that I, this is the peak of my evolution as a human being. And I just don't see it that way. So um, it's like, wow, my life sucks right now. Everything is bad. My relationship's falling apart. My business is falling apart. Um, I'm broke. Uh, my family has disowned me. Like even my dog doesn't like me, right? Okay. Okay, now this is actually how my mind works. I start going, okay, all of this is my fault. This is actually what I say in my head. All of this is my fault. That's amazingly good news because that means that I'm entirely in control. I can start making different decisions, start gaining different skills, and I will get a different result. And then I would just work backwards. Like, what's the most important one of those to fix first? Is it family? Is it the business? Uh, is it my dog? <laughs> Uh, and then you start getting new skills, acting differently and getting a different result, like period. And that, that is what I do every time that I'm going through a dark period. And honestly, like, ooh, it is so rare that I have a bad day. I'll have bad moments. Oh, for Shwayze, for Shwayze. But I have built so many mental mechanisms that they kick in. Right. So when something horrific happens, it's like I go through the same gyration as everybody else. Like, oh, my God, like it's all fun. Everything is crumbling down. And then I've just gotten good at shortening that time period. So 
I, you may look at me from the outside and, and think that it didn't even register, right? Because I've worked to, I mean, depending on the scope, I've worked to get that to the point where minor stuff doesn't even register on my face. Catastrophic stuff is, you know, let's say a, a 20 minute deal with the situation and then cool, I'm ready to go. And that doesn't mean that I don't have to keep processing, you know, I mean, I may be processing for a month, two months, but I'm not stuck. I'm not in a rut. Uh, and that's important. So, you know, I, I may like the reason I say I don't have a bad day is I'll bounce in and out of positivity, even even on day one on ground zero. I'm I'm doing the things mentally to get myself focused and moving forward. And does that play into cultivating that sense of perspective in the long term or do you do, use a different process for that? Yeah, I'm not really thinking necessarily so long term. In that moment, I'm relying on um, all of my mantras, for lack of a better word, so I can learn anything I put my mind to. All of this is my fault. And so all of I say all of those things to regain a sense of that I'm in control and that I can change. So it's not permanent. And I think yeah. that's the important part. Like the, and, and another one, this too shall pass. Like no matter how emotionally devastating, I just know this will pass. Like this will pass. So, you know, the loss of a loved one, which when it like not, please don't think this is me cheapening it. It's just, so I've, I've lost grandparents, but honestly, like nothing hit me like losing my first um, dog that Lisa and I had. He was like our son. And so when he died, it was devastating. And I did not expect to be um, hit emotionally at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I was super flippant about it because he had like really, really bad health problems and had a heart condition. And so it was just like, I always knew we were on borrowed time with him. And uh, so I would make light of it and I would joke about it um, before he passed away and thinking like, I'm just not like emotional like that. And so I'll be fine. And then when it happened, I was like, dude, this is brutal. Like I could get emotional right now. This is what two plus years later, if I let myself. And even then I was like, this will pass. Like the crushing sort of sense of loss will pass. And it does. It always does. I mean, it's just the human condition. And do you refer back to previous experiences to, in order to remind yourself that this will pass? You know, it's funny. I, I do now because I've had enough sort of big knocks. Um, but when I first started, cause I, it's a Buddhist concept. And so when I first read it as a Buddhist concept, it really stuck in my mind, but then I didn't have enough sort of big losses to really think about it that way. Um, so it really was just, I accept that really, um, wise people have like banked their chips on this. You know, my whole thing is you have to open yourself up to being changed. So when you read this too shall pass and you don't have some sentiment in your own life that already echoes that, you have to open yourself to being changed by that. And so I opened myself to being changed by that. Um, I took it on. And so then it was there for me in those moments of tremendous loss when I was totally unprepared. Yeah. That's great. Do we have any other questions from Facebook Live before we wrap up today? Danbro, Danbro Dan Fitness yeah. in the hizzy. All right, so how much do you break down your goals? If you reach your goal quickly, do you reset all your goals? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So yeah, let's I take... Can, I can speak to that, too. He does. <laughs> 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 he does, absolutely. <laughs> uh, welcome to the team, everybody. <laughs> yes. Uh, so do you want to hit him up with a question? Play Jeopardy? Yeah, so um, do you reset your goals if you reach them quickly is yeah. essentially the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that's critical. And so here's why we're all going to achieve at Impact Theory. Because we set ridiculously high goals, we're willing to shift our thinking over into exponential thinking and fully accept that the way that we're thinking now is almost certainly by definition linear. So to hit this gigantic goal rather than brush it off. And, and the one thing that, you know, we talk a lot about as a team is don't, don't do the dismiss Tom and he's got these crazy big ideas um, because that, that it, it will feel good in the moment because it, then it's not scary to think that I'm going to fire you if you don't live up to that standard because it's not how I'm, th how I'm thinking. I'm setting that big goal to force us into a new realm of thinking, but we have to believe that it's real because the moment we think, oh, 500,000 by the end of the year, it's not real. And so that's just Tom like throwing a pie in the sky. Um, 
But, and we didn't start there. So let me walk you through what we actually did. So when we started, we said, we're gonna have the ecosystem at 100,000 um, by the end of the year. Now, internally, I didn't want that number because that number isn't exciting to me because when I project out and I think about how many people we're helping, the likelihood that we're um, making significant revenue, the likelihood that we're able to do the things that we want to do if we're at 100,000, like it's, it's low. So that's not exciting for me. But I wanted the team to have an anchor number so that it wouldn't just seem stupid because especially like we – in the beginning, you need you need to really feel in your gut that we can do this, right? So going back to the Unabomber, who was not somebody I expected to make an appearance later in the show, uh, if it's got to feel like it's going to be hard as hell, but doable. And because of the way just that I, the things that excite me, the number in my head was always 500,000. So, but I didn't want to say that out loud at first because I wanted to give everybody an anchor number that would be exciting for you guys you would, be, like, you would be jazzed about it. You would feel about 100,000 the way I felt about 500,000. You would believe that it was gonna be hard but doable the way that I felt 500,000 was hard but doable. Um, and the only difference was if you guys failed to hit your number, you would be crestfallen and I wouldn't be. I would be angry. Like I would be angry at myself for having not made the right decisions and I would feed that anger because I know how much it would serve me. And the thing that was scary, and this was something, um, I won't name names, but somebody on our team uh, used to think of me back at Quest as like, oh, you can't even talk to him. And that shit scares me, right? Because that's like the worst possible universe to exist where that person feels like somehow they're not just a person. Because once I think it, people can see no matter what somebody's accomplished, like it's just another person who may be playing better games with their own mind than you. And so they're getting a more effective result, but there's nothing they have fundamentally that's different than you. And so what I'm trying to do is the anger I know will scare people. And that's why I brought up me, you know, people thinking, oh my God, like he's like this scary, intimidating figure. So if they saw me get angry, it was paralyzing because they were just waiting for me to swing that anger at them. And so there's, there's nothing more hateful than feeling like your job is tenuous. Like there's nothing more hateful. And one of the reasons that people want to start their own company is not because they're going to be good at it. It's not even because they want to run the company. They probably don't even know what that entails. It's actually more terrifying when it's your company because then, yeah, it's just, we can go into that some other time, but it's all on you, right? So, right. Um, but what they want is to feel like they can't be fired. And there's like, that's so nice. That feels so good. And that is a huge driver for me. I would actually rather feel like if I fuck up, I lose everything, but it's all on me than to feel like someone could fire me. Right? I mean, you guys know that. It's such a shitty feeling. So people don't want to. So I'm so cautious with my anger because for me, I'm never angry and out of control. Okay? Anger is a tool. It's something that I use. It's, it's like anything. If you focus on it, it's real. So for those moments, man, I'm feeling the anger. I'm not faking it, right? I'm feeling the anger, but I'm allowing myself to feel it. I'm using it as a tool. It's like um, wielding a, a, a flaming stick, right? Yes, you could burn everything down with it, or you could just set it down, put some sand on it, and it's out. As long as you know that you're in control of that, now it's a powerful tool. So that's how I think about anger. So for me, if we miss, if we miss 100,000, I will fucking chew through the walls, Right, because I will, we will just have failed so catastrophically. I, I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> so, if, I, if we miss five hundred thousand, which, by the way, we almost certainly will. Like I know that, but it 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 forces me to go. The one thing I won't tolerate of myself is that at the end of the year, if I look back and say we didn't hit this number because I didn't take it seriously and I didn't force myself to really like change my thinking, then I'll be, then I'd really be upset with myself because that's just, I mean, that's like making excuses. That's the same way I think about it. But if we go all out and we did everything we could and we were really, like we really tried to crush it and we miss it, yeah, fine. I might still use a little bit of anger, frustration to make sure that like I kick into an even higher gear, but it's very different than being disappointed in myself. I may be disappointed in the results, but I won't be disappointed in myself. So, and that's what, you know, I really want everybody here to understand is like, w we should all want that. 
right? And so like, let's just do everything we can to hit that number and understand that none of us are going to, we're gonna judge each other by how we thought, like what our thought process was, how much ownership we all took, how hard we worked, but none of us are gonna like be pissed if we miss our number, but feel like, dude, everybody left it on the court. And likewise, if, if you guys check out at month seven because we hit the 100,000, which we almost certainly will at the rate that we're growing, be way ahead of our schedule and go, but we hit it, dude. Why is he still, like, why is he pushing harder? We said it was 100,000. Like, what's going on? Like, and we all just want to kick back and, you know, have a brew. It's like, that's a fundamental misunderstanding of what we're trying to do. So it's like, once people can get their minds around you, your life, I don't care if you're employed by somebody else, your life is yours. And if hitting that goal makes you want to retire, even for the next six months, then you, you haven't found your passion yet. You're not doing what you were meant to do. You're not following your bliss, right? And that's why it's so easy for me to get angry or frustrated because I know what I'm trying to do and I want to be challenged. And I want, I want to find LL Cool J in a parking lot and rap battle. Like, that's what I want. Like, I want to keep pushing. I want to put in an extraordinary performance and I want to be capable of it. So I'll learn whatever lessons I have to learn, but until I'm capable of that extraordinary performance, I won't be, I won't relax, no way. So goals are important, but they're not an end point. They're just a guide to, on your longer journey toward greatness. Yeah, I won't even say it's a guide, man. It's a, it's a, a, a cattle prod. Yeah. That's why you always have to move it. Goals are cattle prods. <laughs> Yes. You heard it here first. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I have no idea what that was like from the outside, but that was amazing for me there at the end, especially if you guys want to know what it's like truly behind the scenes here and what we're trying to do from our own mindset perspective. You literally just spent, um, we'll call that 10 or 15 minutes with us, just raw um, impact theory style. That is what we're all about. And that's how I think we're going to build something special. And it really felt cool to me, uh, to have you guys here for that and watch it. And I'd love to know uh, what you guys thought and what you took away from that. Um, so yeah, this community is everything, man. I spend so much time in the comments. Uh, I hope that you guys are, are there and engaged and, um, yeah, it's just amazing. And for those that, uh, wonder, it really is me. <laughs> I really am, uh, the one commenting. Uh, I write the content, um, there are times I will be fully transparent where Cindy will post long after I've gone to bed, uh, but she's posting things that I wrote earlier in the day. So uh, we're just trying to maximize the number of people that see it and engage with it. So guys, thank you so much for joining us for this very special episode of After Impact, where we went deep on Wyclef Jean. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Peace out.